to our first Harvard Moore and Harvard Business School event, where I hope you will take home some interesting tips on getting to know how to get paid what you're worth. And I've talked to some of you in the crowd already, and you have issues with it, like we all have issues with it, and you're all very accomplished people, so we have an incredible group here who are really going to help you with this, and I'm really excited about it. And my journey to this event and to this esteemed panel here, I don't mean to stand in front of them, um, began last year um, at a trustee meeting that I was doing for my high school, which is a woman's, uh, a girl's school up in Boston near you. It's the Dana Hall School. And what was very interesting, it's remained a girl's boarding school, and funnily enough, there's actually a... Um, a Harvard study on it because they maintained being all girls all the way through the brain drain that happened in the 70s when all the girls went off to boys' schools. Um, a famous alumni had given a large bequest and some of the trustees were saying, oh my goodness, why does this always happen? Why do women wait so long to actually give a bequest? Why, do, why don't women give more while they're still alive and in their, in their prime of their lives. And later that week, what was really interesting is I attended an event at Hunter, which is also a women's institution, and I heard the same complaints. And what everybody was saying is, why don't women give philanthropically like men, and why don't they give during their lifetimes? So I've been editing magazines for my entire life, and I've only edited magazines for women, so I can tell you I know some things about women. Women are not stupid, and they're not stingy. So why would they behave this way? So to, to suss out those answers, we did a story which was called, How Much Money is Enough? And we interviewed dozens of women out there, and we experts, and even accomplished women feel constantly on the brink of what I call, this is my word for it, bag ladydom. And what was really interesting is we asked what would actually make them feel secure. And these were women at all economic levels, you know, n women who were accomplished, so not all the way struggling at the bottom. Um, but only a bank account with north of $10 million was the number to make anybody feel secure. Now, okay, for you girls in the room, who are doing it Harvard Business School way, that's great. For the rest of the world, what the heck does that mean for all of us, right? So underlying those financial anxieties are several other facts which we uncovered. Women are expected to outlive their male spouses by almost a decade. Women are more likely than men to provide caregiving for their elderly parents and also for children who might not be up and rolling the way they should be. 40% of households today are headed by a single woman. And we still make 79 cents to every male dollar. So to make you understand what that means, imagine, just imagine, I mean just absolutely imagine, fantasize, that women were actually paid the same as men. Okay, we're all in this room, we're all paid exactly the same as men, there's no wage gap. After 79% of the year, which is around October 15th, their paychecks would run out. We all wouldn't be getting paychecks anymore. And that would mean that every woman in this room would be working from October 15th till December 31st for free. That's one way to make it very concrete and understand what it is. I don't know about you, I don't feel like doing that. And in the press, women are told this is their fault, that they don't lean in or they don't speak up at meetings, they don't negotiate their salaries, and even more egregious, they take their maternity leaves in order to, goodness gracious, procreate the next generation of workers. I mean, what can you do with women? So luckily for me, just at the moment when I thought we might have to create a million woman march on Washington to change this thing, or I had a really terrible idea, um, which Robin Ely luckily uh, disabused me of, which was trying to get every woman in America to stand up and actually 
tweet out her salary, which she'll explain why that's a horrible idea. Just at that, just at that moment when I decided I was at the end of my rope and Moore had to do something about it, an email from a very old friend, Jim Eisner, who's the director of media and public relations at Harvard Business School, crossed my desk. And it announced that Harvard Business School was taking on this and other problems head on by creating the Harvard Business School's gender initiative. Now, we'd already assigned the lovely Elizabeth Weingarten from New America, who's up on the stage here, the task of investigating whether or not making salaries transparent could crack this nut. I was still hoping for my Twitter campaign. And as we saw after the Sony Pictures hack, when Jennifer Lawrence discovered she was being paid less for American Hustle, she was so embarrassed that she didn't fight harder for her own salary that she wrote a letter in Lena Dunham's publication called Lenny to explain why. And if you can believe it, here's Jennifer Lawrence, okay, one of the best actresses, I think, out there right now. She didn't want to, she wanted to be liked, and she didn't want to seem like a brat, and so she didn't argue too hard unlike her male co-stars, right? Um, then Charlize Theron openly negotiated for pay equal to that of her male co-star for The Huntsman, which amounted to a $10 million raise. Okay, that's one way to get it. I'm not Charlize Theron. I don't know how many of you are. Um, but would something like that work for women like you and me? So I asked Jim if we could assemble the best and the brightest that Harvard has and to get some new answers, and luckily he was game. So remember to tweet and post about our event using the hashtags. We have HBS Gender, and then we have Get Paid More. So let me introduce our fabulous moderator, Robin Ely. Robin is the Diane Dorgi Wilson Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, where she teaches and does research on diversity, race, and gender within organizations. At HBS, she is also Senior Associate Dean for Culture and Community. And most important in terms of this evening's program, Faculty Chair of the School's Gender Initiative. The Gender Initiative is an interdepartmental effort that was formally launched, formally launched by HBS last spring to accelerate the advancement of women leaders and promote gender equity in business and society. The initi initiative faculty conduct research on a broad range of topics. Recent, recent studies have looked at the impact of working mothers on the future careers of their daughters. You probably read that piece that came out recently and at the ways that cultures of overwork lock gender inequity in place. But no topic seems to have a bigger news hook these days than inequities in compensation. So I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight and to hand the proceedings over to Robin. And here she is. Thank you, Thank you, Leslie, for that introduction um, and uh, for um, saying a lot about uh, the, the Gender Initiative. It's a, really a pleasure to be able to have this collaboration with Moore. We launched the Gender Initiative last spring, and um, this is you know, exactly the kind of thing, although I have to say it, it never occurred to me that this exact thing would happen, but this is the kind of thing that we were really hoping um, would come out of the launch of the Gender Initiative that we would be able to um, bring to groups like you uh, what scholarship has to say about gender um, and race and other aspects of identity in organizations. What, what does the research have to say um, about those dynamics at work? Because so often I think the dialogue out there is not well informed by what we actually know um, uh, from the research. So. So this is just a great opportunity, and I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so the question that we're here to consider tonight is, um, is how you can ensure that you are getting paid what you're worth. Um, but I want to expand it a little bit and say it's not just about getting paid what you're worth. Um, it's also about creating the conditions um, that will enable you to thrive and to bring your value to work. So it's about getting paid, but it's also about something broader, and I think You'll hear um, from our panelists about that. <clears throat> so um, let me just introduce each of them briefly. 
First of all, we have uh, Elizabeth Weingarten. Um, she is the Deputy Director of New America's Breadwinning and Caregiving Program and its Global Gender um, Parity Initiative. Her uh, writing and research focus on gender and security, as well as on care-related issues here and abroad. And as you know, Elizabeth wrote the article, Get Paid What You're Worth, and that was the impetus for our coming together tonight. So thank you, Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to introduce uh, each of the panelists, and then I'm going to um, turn it over. So um, Paul Healy is next, and Paul is a colleague of mine at Harvard Business School. He's a professor of accounting. Um, and his research actually focuses on governance and corruption. But he um, tells me that he started out his career interested in executive compensation. And that's the topic that he's going to talk about tonight and share with us some brand new research findings. So one of the reasons that we started the gender initiative at HBS is that you know, we looked around and we said there are a lot of us here on the faculty whose primary research is about gender. Um, and, um, and, 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 you know, I think there's maybe six or seven of us. There may be more of us than at any other business school in the country whose work actually fully focuses on gender and issues of diversity. Um, but there are also a number of us, and Paul is a really great example, um, who, whose primary research isn't focused on gender, but who are taking their analytical lens and turning it to questions that bear on gender disparities and what we can do about them. So our remaining two panelists are um, experts on gender and negotiation, which is relevant to our topic tonight because the ability to negotiate is a skill that you can hone and that you can use to ensure that you are getting paid what you're worth and that you're also able to create the conditions that allow you to bring your value um, to work. So Hannah Riley Bowles is a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School, but we claim her at HBS because she did her doctoral work with us and got her degree. Um, and she is a leading expert on gender negotiation. She has devoted her career to researching the nuances of how gender affects negotiations. And she's going to share with us tonight insights um, that will help you to become a more successful negotiator. And then finally, Deborah Kolb. Um, is former executive director of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School, and she is professor emerita at Simmons College, where she founded the Center for Gender in Organizations. And she's going to share her perspective on how you can negotiate to secure wins for yourself and for your organization. Um, she is also author of the recently published book, Negotiating at Work, Turning Small Wins into Big Gains. And I just want to say that it is, it's really an, a pleasure for me to have these people to my right, um, that one of my colleagues from Harvard Business School who doesn't normally do work on gender is here to talk, uh, talk to us about his work and um, to have these two amazing uh, scholars of gender and negotiation. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth now, who's going to tell us what she uh, learned in the course of writing this piece. Well, thank you so much, Robin, and thank you to Harvard Business School and more for this amazing opportunity. Um, it was such a fun piece to write, but it's even more fun to be here and um, to, to hopefully you know, talk to you all about uh, this important topic. Um, so I want to just start with a little thought experiment, which is just think for a moment about the last time you talked about your salary with anyone who wasn't your boss or your significant other. Just think about it. So if you're like most people, your, your mind is going a blank, right? Nobody does this, really. Um, generally speaking, talking about your wages is still something that's not really done in polite company. Um, I remember asking my mom how much my dad earned was harder in a lot of ways than asking her what sex was, right? It was, I was so nervous. Uh, and she did end up telling me what sex was. Thanks, mom. Uh, she did not ever tell me how much my father earned. So there you go. I still don't know. Um, so, you know, I've always wondered, why does pay talk make us so uncomfortable? How could keeping quiet about our salaries really be holding all of us back? And what can we as individuals do to kind of thaw this icy environment around pay discussions? So these were some of the questions that really drove the story in More Magazine uh, this month. Uh, 
I, I learned through reporting all about the enduring and illegal policies uh, and workplace rules that forbid pay talk. Um, you know, what it is really about this conversation that strikes fear in our hearts and the history of how we all came to be so very tight-lipped about salary. It hasn't been like this forever. Um, but, you know, like any story about policy, and I work at a think tank, so I know this is true, this, this story is really about people and about the women, um, like all of us, who are experiencing these things firsthand um, and who have really seen how stifling pay talk can also stunt women's ability to get paid what they deserve. So I talked to women across industries who had discovered through various means, lawsuits, bankruptcy, software, and plain old conversations, but that was far less common, um, that they were being paid sometimes millions less than their male counterparts. And then in the middle of reporting this story, I got kind of a cosmic G-chat from a coworker. Uh, she said, hey, can I ask you what may seem like an insensitive question? I said, sure, and then I waited in suspense as those three little dots appeared on the screen, you know. Uh, she said, what's your salary? So our reviews were approaching, and that's the time where managers at New America can kind of dole out bonuses and we can all negotiate for, for more pay. So my coworker wanted to know so she could go into her review armed with information to hopefully get a raise. So I'll admit that immediately I felt a jolt of discomfort, but I think it was really kind of a social reflex because immediately after I felt joy, of course, because I was reporting this story and here was a real-time pay transparency experiment that had fallen into my lap. This is like a reporter's dream. So I was like, of course you can, yeah, sure, I'll tell you. Um, so I told her how much I earn. And I found out later that she was actually able to use that as leverage in her conversation. So she told me, quote, having the information from you put me in a position to argue my case more concretely and confidently. So that was, was um, a really great, really great feeling. So of course, we all know information is power, right? And that is what this all boils down to. Women miss a huge piece of that when they remain in the dark about wages, either through archaic social expectations or workplace norms. So um, as, as Leslie talked about, we've really been inundated recently with so much information about the gender wage gap. We know that at this rate, we will be waiting around for more than 30 years until it closes, that it varies depending on your home city, your industry, and of course your ethnicity. But part of the problem, I think, is that a lot of the information we receive about the wage gap is kind of abstract. It's hard to know exactly kind of how to move the needle on the gap and how it affects your life. So really, one of the purposes of the article was to lay out a practical path for women to improve their own kind of financial standing um, and to start to change the culture around the wage gap by radically just starting to talk about our wages. But this doesn't just mean gabbing about it with your girlfriends, it also means talking about it with your male colleagues too. So on that note, according to Vanity Fair, we were just hearing about Jennifer Lawrence, uh, Bradley Cooper, who has um, co-starred with Jennifer Lawrence, of course, may now be sharing salary information with the women he works with to help them negotiate. So he said, I quote, usually you don't talk about financial stuff, you have people for that. But you know what? It's time to start doing that. So hopefully you'll all concern, you know, if you don't listen to me, listen to Bradley Cooper. Um, and you know, I, obviously great advice and I know there will be so much other great advice from this um, amazing panel. So um, I'm excited to start the conversation. So thanks all for being here. So thank you for, uh, for inviting me. I, I do feel a little bit like an interloper here since uh, this is not my <laughs> normal area. Uh, but I'm going to talk about a study that I have uh, just finished with two colleagues. Uh, one, Boris Goisberg, who does work in this space, and another, a doctoral student of ours, Eric Lin. And the question we were really interested in is, uh, what happens when you switch jobs? And, and does that change the, 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 the gender gap that we see? And I, and I think that if you, if you look at the biggest driver of people's pay, it's usually what they were paid last year. And of course, that goes back what they were paid the year before, and so, so on. And so 
really, if you think back to what would you start, what was your starting salary or starting wage, often that's a really important component of what you're paid today. And the question we were interested in was, can you break that cycle somehow by switching jobs, moving to a different firm? And so the, what we are looking at is uh, we're, we're going to look at a, at a sample of more than 2,000 executives. So these are uh, senior and junior executives um, that are global, uh, work, work, work throughout the world, not just in the US. And um, it's over a period of seven years, from 2004 to 2011. And the data is collected from um, a global search firm. And so the first question is, is the gender gap that we see, that Leslie mentioned, is that affected by changing your job? And then the second question we were interested in is, if we find that, some evidence of that, how does, uh, how does the scarcity, the relative scarcity of women in the labor force affect that gap? And how does the changing jobs affect that gap? So is there a, sort of an interaction here? And in particular, we were interested in looking at um, if you think that there's fewer women represented in senior positions than in more junior positions, do you see this gap change um, being more significant for senior positions than junior? Uh, there are certain industries that you can think of that are more male-dominated than, um, than more, more diversified. And so do you see the same, th same effect in, in, in male-dominated uh, industries where maybe the, the, scarce, the relative scarcity of women uh, might actually lead to changes when you switch jobs. And lastly, function. There are some functions where um, there's more, relatively more men than women. Is that, are those also where there's a scarcity issue? And so we looked at, we looked at each of those, and if you're thinking about um, which industries we're looking at, so male-dominated industries being, many, this is based not on our sample, but actually based on the, the, the economy as a whole, right? And so we're looking at male dominated being manufacturing, finance, construction, um, wholesale. More balanced uh, industries would be uh, retail, education, professional services, uh, public sector. And so, so uh, we're going to compare those two. And then in the same in, in male dominated functions, finance, sales, operations, R&D, general management. Uh, where there's more balance would be HR, marketing, uh, legal services. And so we're going to compare those two. It's interesting, actually, that if you, look at the, if you look at the usage of the search firm, we find, actually, that search firms are used more frequently in the more male-dominated industries and functions, which suggests that maybe those firms and functions are, are, are trying to look for and try to, try, to, try to reach women more than they, would, than they are in industries that are, and, and functions that are more balanced. So a total sample is, has got 18% women and 72% men. So the first result is this is what happens on average to salary uh, before and after. So you can see the before. So the blue line is the men. And you can see that men basically get 19% more, or 19 and a to 20% more than women before the um, before they switch jobs. If you, if you control for a lot of other factors that people think drive compensation, like what industry you're in, the title of your job, your experience, um, what country you're in, all of those factors matter, then you see that the job, uh, the, the, the gender gap drops to around 11 or 12%. And then if you look at what happens afterward, you can see that the gap actually shrinks. It shrinks from about 195 to 20% down to about 14% before you control for all these other factors. And you also see that after you control, it drops down to around 6%. So that's about a 45% drop from switching jobs. So the second question, as I mentioned, that we asked was, uh, what happens if you look at industries, functions, where there's relatively more scarcity? And let me show you those results. So the bottom line is actually that scarcity matters and makes, a makes quite a big difference. In fact, most of these results seem to be driven by scarce, relative, relative scarcity of, of, of women in the workplace. So if you look at senior and junior, you see that the gap for uh, before for senior positions is about 12%, and it goes down to 
after switching a job. Uh, in contrast, there's a smaller shift down uh, in, the, in the gap for, uh, uh, for junior positions. And, and this, is, this is controlling for all the other factors that, dr that drive your compensation, your, you know, your education, your, your experience, et cetera. If you look at, um, and, I, and I'm blanking that I don't, my glasses, I'm not, I need to put glasses. <laughs> is this next one industry? It's industries, right. Mm -hmm. So the next one is industries. If you look at industries where, um, uh, where, uh, that are more male dominated industries, the gap is, is large and significant before the switch and it drops substantially afterwards. You can see that it's gone to, as I said, I don't have my glasses on, I'm showing my age here. Uh, it drops from, what is that, like 19% to six or something like that. I, I, 16 to, yeah. okay, thank you. But you also see that in, in more balanced industries, actually there's not much of a change actually. And then lastly, if you look at functions, you'll see again the same pattern, that if you look at male dominated functions, you see a much bigger drop in the gender gap from switching jobs uh, than you do in, in, in uh, functions that are more balanced functions where there's more re representation of men and women. Um, so, so what do I conclude? You know, first of all, on average, it seems like switching jobs actually helps. Right? It, it makes a difference, drops the, the gender gap that we've talked about by about 45%. Uh, and the decline seems to be even larger when you look at industries and functions and, and situations where women are relatively underrepresented, which suggests, at least to me, that, that many industries and many firms today are more sensitive about this issue. And they're more sensitive in precisely those areas where women are relatively underrepresented. What's interesting is maybe we're giving people, we're giving firm, or firms are forgetting to look at these industries where women are well represented and thinking that the problem is solved there when in fact it's, it's, it's really not. Um, so so that, that, let, me, let me stop there and pass it on to Hannah. There. Okay, great. Um, so I'd actually like to start out by um, uh, saying how much I appreciate Leslie's opening comments because I think that it's so important, her point, that we not blame the women um, in this conversation. It's critically important. Um, and uh, I think the other thing I want to highlight is Robin's point that we think beyond money. And, and actually, Debbie's going to talk a lot about this. Um, that, you know, I mean, arguably, maybe our income, our lifetime earnings depend more on our career trajectories than any negotiation at any point in time. So we want to think about negotiating our career paths, not only um, certain amounts of money at, money at certain points. Um, that said, I really like your results, and <laughs> seems like good advice to follow. Now, as much as I want to get beyond this um, blaming the women, I am going to take an individual. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to riff off of Elizabeth's awesome piece. Um, so I did my dissertation looking at the effects of ambiguity on gender and negotiation, and there's been you know, research over the past 10 years about this, but it takes someone with a voice like Elizabeth to get the word out. Um, and so I'm going to talk about why um, why, does, why does ambiguity facilitate gender effects in negotiation? I'm going to share with you some of the results, some of the theory behind that, and maybe a few ideas of what one can do. I'm going to take this individual perspective, even though I don't think we should blame the women. Um, I don't want the women to have to wait around for the tectonic plates of society to shift before they do something. So I'm taking a very individual, kind of pragmatic perspective. OK, so ambiguity. I want you to think in terms of there are three sources of ambiguity in negotiation. There's the ambiguity about who is negotiating, right? There's ambiguity about how to negotiate. And there's also ambiguity about what is negotiable, right? And all these three can uh, influence the potential or can heighten the potential for gender effects in negotiation. So what happens with the ambiguity about who is that when we don't know our counterpart very well, we're going to try to figure out, well, what type of negotiator are they going to be, right? And if you actually look at the research on gender differences in negotiation, there aren't stable differences between men and women in terms of how they negotiate. It's like we experience every day. Sometimes men are more cooperative than women. Sometimes women are more competitive than men, right? But what is very robust is our beliefs, actually, that men are going to be competitive negotiators. 
and that women are going to be cooperative. And when we don't know the person on the other side, we may consciously or unconsciously use that information about their gender to presume that they're going to fulfill that stereotype. Ambiguity about how increases women's reticence to negotiate. So, I mean, it is really remarkable. Um, there was originally this stuff, oh, women don't negotiate. We need to give them more training. We need to make them more competent. We need to give them more confidence. I mean, I think if you look at women like Jennifer Lawrence and Sheryl Sandberg, I mean, they're pretty confident <laughs> and very competent. You know, That's not why they were feeling reticent about negotiating. They were feeling reticent about negotiating. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, because it's more risky for women, actually, to self-advocate, to negotiate for themselves than it is for men. And so if women are more reticent, it's actually a very reasonable response to the social environment. It's a sign of their being smart, um, not less competent or, or confident. And the what, ambiguity about the what, increases gender gaps in outcomes. So what happens, what a number of studies have shown, that particularly in masculine stereotype domains, money is one, right? That in ambiguity, we commonly find that women will enter a negotiation with lower expectations than the men, ask for less, and walk out with less. And I'll talk a little bit about why this is. But this is really important that we overcome this, this ambiguity about what is negotiable so that we walk in with the same expectations. If you walk in with the same expectations, you're likely to walk out with the same um, result. OK, so why is ambiguity a problem? I've started hinting at this. One of these issues is gendered social networks. So gendered social networks are going to influence the type and the quality of information that men and women receive, right? So think about in a male-dominated organization. In a male-dominated organization, men are likely to have, if you ask them about their social networks, they're likely to be dominated by men, and they're likely to describe a lot of overlapping work and friendship ties, right? So those closer relationships create opportunities and the basketball court or at the barbecue or the golf course or wherever to say, well, how did so-and-so get that? Or how do I approach this? Or how do you get, you know, how, does so, how much does so-and-so get, excuse me, get paid or whatever? Um, it also could create more opportunities in terms of access to negotiation opportunities. If you have that close relationship, you can kind of look for the moment to open the conversation, right? Um, there's another piece of this with regard to networks influencing biased information searches is that if you're in an industry or an organization where men are paid more than women, and the guys are asking the guys, well, how much do you get paid? Or how much should I ask to be paid, right? And the women are asking the women, uh -huh. that's not discrimination. Uh. They're just going to sample. They're going to come up with different numbers, right? Uh -huh. And so those, those gender biases in the social network, where you're getting the information, can influence that, 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 those expectations entering the negotiation and what you ask for and ultimately what you receive. So one of the things to do, I can go on and on about this and kind of highlight the top things. One of the things you need to do is kind of reach out beyond convenience networks. I mean, really think about where you're getting your information and that it's not um, biased uh, by, by, these, by these sort of gendered information and advice and support networks. OK, stereotypes. There are two kinds of stereotypes. There are the, the way they are stereotypes, so like things like men like sports and women like soap operas or drama or something, right? <laughs> Um, now, one um, way they are stereotype or a descriptive stereotype is that men are better negotiators than women. We have this idea that men are going to be more analytic, more competitive, more assertive, and that that's going to pay off for them. And there is research showing that these awareness of these stereotypes, particularly in ambiguity, if we're walking in a little bit nervous, that these can deflate our performance. And it doesn't have to be that you believe them. Just your awareness of the stereotype can influence your behavior. There are also way you should be stereotypes. These are prescriptive stereotypes. So we have these ideals about how we like women to behave. We want we, we, the ideal woman puts others ahead of herself, right? We, and she's really nice, right? Now, when you're negotiating, though, you're not Sometimes, and we're actually a lot of, we got a lot of research now showing, is that women, women self advocate in the same voice that a man self advocates. People actually find both of them a little less nice and overly demanding. Um, but when the woman does it, they kind of say, mm, I don't want to work with her, right? And that's where the social risk comes in. 
It is these prescriptive stereotypes, these gender-based ideals that women violate when they advocate for themselves as opposed to advocating for others. Now, one little good news point, we're great at negotiating for others, and, it's, and we expect women to be really assertive negotiating for others, so don't feel hemmed in there. But if you have reticence advocating for yourself, it's not because of some, you know, your fault. It's not because of a problem in you, lack of confidence or ability. It's that you're reading the environment and you're getting an icky feeling because this is tough, you know? So what do you do? One thing is reducing ambiguity. And I think actually Elizabeth's article really illustrates this nicely, like with your friend. You know, she went in, she kind of knew. She knew what she should be asking for. She understood the norms. When we go in, we've done our homework. We have a sense of, we've got a good sense of the who. We have a good sense of the how. We have a good sense of the what. These gender stereotypes just are, they're, they're not useful. They're, they're, they don't influence our thinking. We're not searching the environment for how should I enact this situation? What should I be asking for? We already know. So in studies, when we give men and women the same expectation going into gender stereotypic negotiation, they get the, there's no gender difference in the outcomes, right? It's just in the ambiguity that these gendered norms and stereotypes um, influence our, uh, uh, influence our, our behavior and ultimately our outcomes. And then finally, um, one other thing that you can do, and I'll just kind of close on this, is what I call an I-we strategy. And I've actually kind of learned this language from Cheryl. <laughs> As an academic, I called it relational accounts. Isn't that a compelling name? <laughs> um, so, but I've learned uh, to call it an I-we. I think it's getting more resonance. But, but in terms of thinking about, this is when we did a lot of research saying, well, how could women negotiate and kind of both get what they want and make the social impression they want to make? And actually, let me preface this before I go on. Jennifer Lawrence in her thing partly said, well, why should I be kind of contorting myself coming up, you know, in order to ask for something? And I'm actually very sympathetic with that perspective. Um, and I think if, if using some sort of special strategy to get over these things felt inauthentic, you shouldn't do it. Um, but actually, if you look at the negotiation literature and you look at the best advice to negotiators, it's to do this I-we type of thing. It's to start off and come up with legitimate explanations for what, why what you're asking for is appropriate, you know? But legitimate not in your eyes, I deserve it. Legitimate in their eyes, right? Why would they think that what you're asking for um, is, is right, right? It's, it's, it's what the, it fits company norms, it fits their values, it's fair, again, in their eyes. And then secondly, doing some signaling that you have thought about your, their perspective and they're taking their perspective. And in Cheryl's Lean In book, she's got, the, she's got a nice example. So as I mentioned, she actually talks about the fact that she almost didn't negotiate. And it, I think it was her brother-in-law who said to her, you've got to be kidding me. Like, you cannot, there's no way you cannot negotiate. And so this is the strategy that she came up with. And actually, she and I connected because she said, you know, this is the advice I give. I have no idea if there's research behind it. <laughs> and as a sign of how smart she is, she had come up with this idea years before, and we were still trying to, we'd, we'd finally demonstrated it at the lab years later. But what she says in the book, this is quoting from her book, she said, you know, she walks in, she's becoming, you know, Facebook COO, and she says, you know, of course you realize you're hiring me to run your deal team, so you want me to be a good negotiator. Mm -hmm. It's a great legitimate argument, right? Because if I'm not negotiating, you're hiring the wrong person, right? And then the second thing she says is this is the only time you and I will ever be on opposite sides of the table. And that's the we. So I'll leave it there and follow on. Deb's got, Deb will expand on this with strategies. <clears throat> so um, Leslie, I wanted to tell you a, a funny story that I appreciated when you talked about um, uh, women and uh, their legacies. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, I had a very stressful train ride. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, when, I, when uh, my husband and I had our 25th college reunions, he went to Harvard and I went to Vassar when it was an all-women's school, and at his 25th reunion, he had classmates in our house, I don't know, several times a month, talking to him about how much money he was going to give for his 25th reunion. And nobody talked to me at all. Um, I, we gave him the same amount. And I said to the president of Vassar, how come you didn't ask? You know, at Harvard, they just ask. And she said, 50th reunion, when the husbands <laughs> die, that's when <laughs> <laughs> So I want to take a little bit of a different tack. I don't really study how people negotiate about compensation. I'm really interested about how people negotiate at work, and they negotiate for the roles. And one of the things we pick up sort of on Sheryl Sandberg and sort of a study that was just done in McKinsey and Lean In, they talked about why is it 
that we have, we have a gap in sort of women acceding to senior leadership roles. And there are a number of explanations. Um, one was the channeling to staff roles versus line roles. Um, the, what I call the flexibility or the motherhood penalty, the kinds of th penalties that women, that women face um, because of, you know, sort of, of, of who they are. Um, and so those are the kinds of things we call them in our work, second generation gender bias. And it's the idea that in organizations which have been sort of designed to fit the lives of men, policies, practices, cultural assumptions um, that look like they're natural and neutral have differential impacts on women. And so from my, what I like to look at is how you negotiate around those to move into more senior leadership roles. This is sort of an example of what second generation gender bias um, <laughs> might look like. <clears throat> so what I'd like to say is that women have to negotiate for more things. So the first is that um, fit. Um, we have a sense that some jobs are more appropriate for women and some for men, and so we tend to see that women get channeled into staff roles, men into line roles. Um, I work with a bunch of, I do a lot of executive teaching, and so in one organization, which is a manufacturing organization, one of the things that they found was that systematically in the plants, they were channeling, they were uh, putting women into HR kinds of roles even in the beginning of their careers so that they never got the experience on operational kinds of roles. And so one of the women that, that we worked with, she sort of said, you know, I, I want to have an operational role, and so she had to negotiate for that. The other thing that happens is uh, I call it hire like me. You know, at a certain level in organizations, you're not really sure about what you're looking for in a leadership role, and people tend to pick people who look like them. And that means that women need to put themselves forward for opportunities. And how do you do that? You know, how do you get yourself on the screen when you're, when you know, when you're not on it? So the first is to recognize that that's happening. So that's, you know, being, that's where social networks are really important. Where are some of the openings happening? Because networks is how, at a certain level, we find out that there are openings. And then it, you have to do what I call positioning yourself for those kind of roles. And what I mean by positioning is making your value visible in a currency that has value to the person you're dealing with. Everybody works hard, but why is it that you should be in a particular kind of role? So that's sort of a negotiation. And I think the positioning is really important. The second is, what we know is that women do a lot of invisible work. Their work becomes a, almost a free good. Um, I have this wonderful story of this woman. She was a communications director in another manufacturing organization. And she was asked by another group to help. And she did. She helped them out. It got great visibility. But they kept relying on her to do it, and she was doing all this invisible work. It was like a free good. And she went to talk to her boss, and she said, I think this work should be mine, too. And he said, time's not right. The issue is, how does she get negotiations going so that she can get value for that work? We know that women play a lot of what I call fixer roles, come in and fix something. And you, know, you fix it, and then you go on to another fixer role. But it doesn't sort of accumulate in a way that's going to that's going to accumulate in terms of a role. And so what she did, she did what I call initiating the negotiation. And so for this other group that kept asking her to help, what she did was she um, she said to them, you know, I'd really love to keep helping you, but I have a day job. And so if you want me to keep doing this, you have to help me. And so she enlisted them as allies to negotiate with her boss so that that work that she was doing, which was seen as a free good, became part of her role. And she got a promotion as part of that, where obviously more compensation comes as well. <laughs> so the ideal worker, I mean, I think this is really um, you know, sort of the work and personal life, the flexibility penalty, the motherhood penalty. One of the things that we find is that the assumptions about people are going to put work behind before all, all else means that it becomes difficult for women to negotiate to have careers that really work for them. And I want to tell you two stories about that, because I think they really are great negotiating stories. One is a story about a woman who was the chief financial officer um, for a, a, a manufacturer, actually a transportation company, and the condition of taking her job was that she had to actually move to corporate headquarters. And she did it. And after her family was there for two years, they said, we're moving back to Chicago with or without you. 
She had her dream job, and nobody had ever not been at corporate headquarters. But she came up with a very creative way, because I think what you have to do in these cir circumstances, I call it anchoring with options, because if you don't have options to propose, you're raising a problem and you become the problem. And so she had a solution, which was something she called the dual office. And one of the nice things about that story is it's now not the case that everybody has to go, uh, be, relocate to the corporate office. She's really changed that. It's sort of a small, it's, it's kind of a small win. The thing about these negotiations, they're not bracketed like, um, like compensation negotiations. They take place in the context of work. They're what I call these little end negotiations. And you have to sort of recognize that they're happening and sort of say, this, these are possibilities for negotiation, and then start to use some of the skills that we know that Tana's talking about and that I sort of write about to actually negotiate about those. And you know, just to come back to Elizabeth's story, her colleague didn't just negotiate for more compensation. She negotiated also for a new role. And so I think those things often really go together. Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to um, just come back and ask a few questions, um, maybe one of each of you, and, um, and then we'll open it up and uh, have a, a broader Q&A. Um, yeah, I think we're doing really well on the time here. So I wanted to start with Elizabeth um, and go back to your article. And I know we spent a lot of time um, talking on the phone, and, um, I, and I, I know that you talked to many, many people. And so um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us, was there anything um, that surprised you in the course of doing the research that you did um, and writing the article? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. Um, I, at the beginning of the reporting, decided that I was going to conduct another experiment. Maybe I should have gone into science. I don't know. I love these experiments. Um, I decided I was going to ask all of the kind of pay transparency experts that I talked to if they would share their salary with me. Um, and I said, you know, this might be published. I'll let you know if it, you know, I, I obviously gave them a lot of caveats, but I said, I'm just kind of wondering. Um, no one did. Um, I think I talked to like 10 different women uh, before I kind of decided to hang the, hang the whole thing up um, and just stop asking <coughs> people. Uh, but it really does get to the heart of this, which is it is really hard. And uh, I recognize that it's hard, and so do the people who, uh, you know, so do the proponents of these uh, policies and people who really do care about the pay gap and care about pay transparency. So that was something that um, continually surprised me. Um, and everybody had a different reason for why they weren't going to tell me, but fundamentally um, that was the case. Um, the other thing um, uh, that I found that was, that was really interesting was some of the women who worked at these organizations that have gone to full pay transparency, so um, some all buffer, both technology companies, also Whole Foods, which has uh, been, had pay transparency since uh, I think the mid 80s. Um, they all told me um, about their experiences there and <coughs> it kind of, I think, flew in the face of a lot of assumptions that we all might make about what it's like to work um, at a company that's fully pay transparent. So, I think a lot of people tend to assume that if you work at a company where everybody knows each other's salaries, we're all going to get so distracted by it. We're constantly going to be comparing ourselves to the person who sits next to us because we know what she makes, and it's just going to be this kind of continuous, um, or, you know, eroding conversation, and and or you know, conversation that will erode the, I guess, workplace environment. Um, that is not true, according to the women that I talked to. Um, they said that it has actually made them more productive because having their salaries transparent has really made it a non-issue, right? Nobody really cares anymore. It's not secret. It's not this kind of you know, taboo, water place cooler discussion. Uh, it's all out in the open, and so nobody really has to feel pressure to, to keep it private or to find out anymore. Um, so that's kind of another piece. Um, the other surprise, I would say, is, is just how recently this transition took place. It really was um, around the turn of the 20th century and just this kind of transition from um, uh, factory work to knowledge work. Um, I think it can seem like we've always been this way, but, but it's relatively recent in our, in our nation's history. So. Thanks. It r reminds me of, um, I, I remember hearing about uh, a research finding. I didn't read it, so I'm always a little bit skeptical <laughs> to re repeat something that I haven't actually read. But 
um, but I suspect it's true, and that is that if, you, if people um, don't know what their colleagues are making, they will systematically overestimate yeah. what the salary yeah. is. Yeah. And so, um, you know, which is, which is the problem, right? You don't, that, that, that's, that's the kind of thing I think that people have in mind when they think about the problem of, of making things transparent. So it might be that actually the transparency um, reduces that problem yeah. and very consistent with what you're saying. Um, so let me go to Debbie. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have the advantage of knowing uh, a, a lot about, um, uh, about the research of, of, of our panelists. And I, um, you, didn't, uh, you didn't talk a lot about this, so I'm, um, but I know it's a big part of your work, so I want to ask you about it. Um, and uh, that has to do with um, how does uh, negotiating around the issues that you classify as second generation bias uh, second generation gender bias, and you told us what that is. Um, how does negotiating around those bring about change in a company more broadly? And maybe you could give us an example. Right. Well, so I gave you one example already, which is the story about the woman and the issue of uh, not having to relocate to the corporate office. Oh, because it created a norm it creates, then. It changes a norm. It changes a norm that was that was unquestioned. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think these they, we call these small wins. I mean, I'm not saying that these are huge, uh, transformative kinds of changes. But I think the degree to which some of these things get negotiated. So the example that I gave about this woman who wasn't on the screen, and she negotiated for a role that uh, I said she made her value visible in a currency that had value. What she negotiated for was not to just put herself forward, but what she negotiated was what's the success criteria for this role? Because that's not the way the person who was trying to fill the role thought about it. He was sort of thinking, well, who, I, know, I have this person, I'm comparing this other person, without really systematically thinking about what makes success in this kind of, uh, kind of role. And the degree to which she gets him to do that, and then we know that often people share those kinds of insights, you know, sort of, we know sort of from some of the work about um, how, how change sort of uh, takes place around some of these issues, that, you know, sort of, Somebody that has an aha like that might share it with somebody else. And so I think that's one way that I think uh, transparency about some of, these, uh, some of these issues. I want to give another example, too, because this is an example that I've given before, and I've gotten a lot of pushback about it, but I, I think it's a great one. It's another work and family one. This is a story about a woman who her boss said to her, do you have a, a suggestion for somebody? She worked in procurement in oil and gas. And the big deal was you had to be, they had to have an overseas assignment, particularly in Africa, which is where they got procured, where they procured the oil and gas. And so her boss says to her, you know, do you have any idea about who might want take this role? And she said, you know, well, I'd like this role. But, you know, he said, but you, you have children, you have a family, you're not going to do it. And she said, you know, you're only thinking about doing it in one way. Your, your model for doing that is you relocate. But you know, the way we do things in procurement, so much of it, it, you don't have to be there all the time. I can do this in a way where I'm there sometime and I'm here sometime. And she then changed the norm for what overseas relocation looked like. Uh, you know, those, they're, small, they're kind of they're small wins. Or the person who gets credit for doing invisible work, people start to say, you know, it's not a free good. And so these kinds of transparency, where you also then come up with criteria for things, I think those kind of make sort of small changes that have the possibility of, of broader change. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so Hannah, um, I'm, I'm, I have two questions I want to ask you, um, and I'm torn between them because I know we don't have a lot of time. But um, I did want to give you an opportunity. Do, are there other things that you would um, like to give as advice? about um, how to negotiate? Because I, I, I know you talked about two things, and I'm just wondering if, there's, if there are other things that you want to offer. Um, I think, am I going to get the second question? To, uh, how constrained <laughs> should I be? Um, I'll give you the second one. OK, good. Oh, then I'll be really quick. But I think if, I want, if I'm going to pick out one thing, if I was going to pick out one thing, I think that the do your homework thing is so important. But I think the other thing is um, role play. It is really hard. I mean, there's a lot of psychological research. This is not a gender issue. This is just a general issue. We are not good at human beings at taking on other people's perspectives. And particularly if we're feeling a little fire in the belly about something, um, it, is, it's, it is hard to sort of figure out what, how, you know, you, you've got all your reasons for why you want something. And you've got to really do some work to figure out how to make 
um, what you want makes sense in their terms. And usually you have a lot of reasons for wanting something, some of which are transparent to you, maybe singularly, um, but a lot of things that will resonate with others. Debbie's got great work where she says, you know, in her role plays, she says, you know, you should ask, you should have people come up with, and this is something to do in role play, come up with the three reasons they would say yes to you. And next, come up with the three reasons why they would say no. I say five. Oh, five. Five, good, five. Five, five good reasons. Five's even better. Um, and then what are your responses? And so I think that this role play, finding, you know, finding friends and partners, and ideally, you know, more than one person to say, you know, this is what I'm thinking, give me feedback, um, would be the one. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so I, I also wanted to ask you um, what you think about company policies that ban salary negotiations. Um, do you think that they are an effective strategy for leveling the playing field? You know, I think. Uh, I think in organizations where you have um, very high frequency entry points with a lot of people coming in with very comparable skills, doing comparable work, I don't think that's a big deal. Um, but at senior executive levels, I worry about it. And I think that implicit in it is this presumption that the organization is fair. Um, and these mm -hmm. stereotypes you know, affect all of us. And when you're coming in as an executive, as Debbie describes, there's a, there's a narrative that you're coming in with. You're explaining what your background is, why it's right for the company, the role that you're going to play. And you need to have an opportunity to really explain the value that you're going to provide and what you want to do. And as Debbie describes, also negotiate much more broadly than, certainly than salary, more broadly compensation, maybe long-term incentives. What is the leadership role you want to play? What is the scope of that? When you would be evaluated? Um, I mean, there's so many, there's so well, the types of change that you'd like to lead to make your work more meaningful and maybe also set yourself up for the next thing that you want to do. So I think actually that it's really does not make sense at senior levels. And if I could just pick up on one other thing that Debbie said, you know, a lot of times exec programs I'll talk about, to Debbie's point that, you know, you're about these kind of small win negotiations is you're negotiating not for yourself alone. Right. Um, there's a lot of research. We got this really nice research. I wish I could show it to you, showing women negotiating salary for herself, women negotiating salary for somebody else. You know, um, we're great advocates for others, and I think we've got to harness that as we go in and realize that you know we're the reason why we've got stereotypes that women earn less than men and these expectations, and that men are in top leadership positions more likely than women, is because it's true, right? And so the stereotypes are a reflection of the structure of society. And when you go in, I mean, all of you, frankly, are examples of women who are you're changing society with your own examples. And as you all rise and succeed, you are changing the expectations about women in leadership and women's compensation. Um, and as well as the norms within the organization. So I think that maybe that's my other, remember you negotiate not for yourself alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Paul, um, I would like you to speak to us about um, the career advice that you would give uh, the women in the room based on your research. Well, well I guess what it says is that you shouldn't feel sh shy about switching jobs. <laughs> and, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I tend to think of myself as being a fairly loyal person. Where, and, you know, you work for an organization and I feel, well, I've got a loyalty to that organization. Um, but at least the evidence that I shared with you suggests that, that maybe you shouldn't feel quite as loyal because the organization may not be quite as loyal as you'd think to you. Um, so, that's, that's, so that's one, one point. And, and, uh, and, I, and I guess the second point would be to not feel uh, hesitant to try to take on functions that would seem to, be, seem to be functions where women have not historically been well represented, that those functions actually were maybe where there are opportunities, <coughs> and in industries where women have been underrepresented, uh, that, that those are opportunities too. I'll add one more thing that I thought was interesting in, in the data that I didn't talk about, and because it's I'm, because it, it's it's a little more tentative, and that is it's interesting that if you if you look at the, the average salary of women in let's call it balanced industries or balanced functions where there are more women in, uh, represented, 
you'll f you see that before women switch jobs, their pay is less than a, p a comparable man. After they switch, their salary goes up, and it goes up to roughly the same level as the man had before the man switched. Now, the man, of course, gets a bump too, but actually s switching jobs it does give you a comparable pay to the man in the same job that you left. 